Hey folks, Steve here, and today I'm going to be doing a video review of Decision Games World War One Deluxe Edition, uh, which just came out this year and is the latest printing of a game that's been around for a while. The original version was from uh, the 70s, and uh, if you go on the Board Game Geek forums, you'll find people who are very uh, willing to point out that the original version from decades ago is a little bit different than uh, the current version, which um, Decision Games has kind of added some mechanics, tweaked some things, made it a little bit more complex, um, ever so slightly more complex than the original version, it seems like. Uh, and so I picked up this game uh, very recently. I've gone through uh, two playthroughs, two solo playthroughs, um, and so this review will be kind of based on uh, those two games and what I think of it. Um, this game is lower on the complexity scale. It is not as complex as, say, uh, Fatal Alliances, which my YouTube channel has so far done a lot of coverage of. Uh, this is a much simpler game, though it does have its uh, various mechanics that are, um, you know, uh, there are some rules exceptions, there are uh, different things within the rules that you got to pay attention to. I would recommend, if you're going to play this, uh, give the rulebook a full read-through first so you kind of understand uh, the way the different mechanics play together. Um, and so, you know, being a World War I game, uh, this one is, as you can see here, the map is primarily uh, Europe. It does have a little bit of a side map here uh, showing the Middle East front. So you have uh, Egypt over here, and it stretches sort of up into the Caucasus. Uh, with Basra way over here in the very far corner. Uh, Western Front, Eastern Front, uh, there are miners involved, and you're sort of seeing the aftermath of my second playthrough here. The counters are kind of scattered uh, a little bit, but um, what we'll do uh, with this video is uh, we'll get into kind of the way the game plays, what are the mechanics that drive the action of the game, um, sort of how it works. And once I show a little bit of that, then we'll uh, segue into sort of my, my thoughts, what's good and bad about the game, um, and just an overall, you know, is this something that would be worth it to you? So uh, let's get into it. Okay, so the game is structured into uh, turns and then phases within the turn. And depending on what scenario that you're going to play in the game, um, you're either going to be playing the full 10-turn main scenario. Uh, you might alternatively play a shortened early war scenario. That's turn 1 and 2. And then there's a late war scenario that is around, I think, turn 7. Uh, and then the game also provides the optional ability uh, to play an 11th turn. And it sort of implies you could even play a 12th if you really wanted to. Some of the game charts uh, provide some numbers for, you know, if you're going to the 12th turn. Uh, but all turns start more or less the same. There's an initiative determination, so who will be playing first in any given phase for the turn, and that is governed by uh, a resource structure within the game called mobilization points, which are basically the main form of currency uh, in the game, and I'll get to that here real shortly. So once initiative is determined, there's then, then an activation of neutrals segment, and within the rules, there are rules for diplomacy, and this is where, really where that comes into play. Each side will get one attempt to influence a neutral power uh, to enter the war. And what's nice is that there are modifiers that will control the success of that endeavor. And so each side, they'll, they'll select the neutral that they'd like to influence, and then they will roll a die. Um, now, the one sad thing uh, that could be said about the game is that it suffers from the flat probability of a 1d6. Uh, normal uh, 1 to 6 die is the standard die of the game, and so everything is essentially um, played off of, you know, those probability charts. And so, you know, the worst result in the world and the best result in the world have an equal chance of occurring, typically, in a die roll in this game. But for the purposes of diplomacy, each country uh, related to whichever side has a certain die roll required to be uh, rolled uh, for them to join the side. And there are modifiers, so for instance, if the central powers manage to control a city in Russia, 
that will provide a bonus to bringing in the Ottomans. Now there is an alternative that you can choose, uh, that is to use the historical entry uh, turns for the different powers. So rather than have this sort of um, interactive diplomacy model, you can simply play with the historical entry dates. I do think, based on the plays that I had, that the historical entry is the more balanced of the two, but uh, the you know the player interactive one can be a little more surprising and fun. Um, and so, uh, after I completed my second game, I did come up with some variant rules that combine the two methods so that there's still some unpredictability a little bit, but it will lean towards uh, the historical uh, uh, way things came out. So if you're interested in seeing those variant rules, I'll put a link to the Board Game Geek thread where I posted those rules if you want to take a look. Um, kind of interesting. I think I'll play the next time with those rules in earnest uh, since you know I kind of got a feel for both styles. Uh, I played one game with a player interactive diplomacy and I played one game with the historical. So I feel like I kind of have a, a decent grasp of what's happening there. Uh, but then once activation of neutrals is complete, the phase uh, then goes to the first impulse. And so this is really where the action of the game occurs, and uh, the reality is that there are uh, essentially three impulses, and within a given impulse, each side gets to take their action in initiative order. So in the first impulse, the side that has initiative moves all of their units, then does all of their attacks, followed by the side that did not have initiative, they move all their units, they do all their attacks, and then it goes to the second impulse, third impulse, um, and then on through uh, to the rest of the turn. So um, important to note is that on the first impulse of any given turn, all the units on the board can be activated. All of them can be moved, all of them can, can attack, uh, but the game is divided up into three fronts. There's the western front, and there is the Eastern Front, and then there's the Middle East Front. And I'm going to try to steer my camera around here so you can get a better view um, of the area. So there is, and you can you probably can't even see it on the camera, but there is a, uh, a line here. Let's see if I can find it right here. It runs around the Italian Front, which is part of the Western Front, and then goes up along through here, and that's the divider between, between the east and the west front. And, and so basically what that means is that anything with dealing with uh, France and Italy, that's the western front, anything that's happening in the Balkans or against Russia is going to be the east front, and then um, very much out of view here, down here where you have Egypt and the Caucasus region, that is all considered the Middle East front, which is, again, it's its own front. So, again, the game structure is such that you're going to move all your units within a front before moving on to the next front until you're complete with all your moves, and then uh, you attack, launch all your attacks as desired, all in one front before moving on to the next, and so on and so forth. Now, you know, this game is, is fairly standard in that, you know, your hex and counter movement is really going to come down to uh, movements, uh, movement points, and attack values. And, you know, this game has, uh, if I try to zoom in a little bit here to show some examples, you can see that there are uh, the units down there in the Balkans. This was sort of at the tail end of a game. I had the uh, Austro-Hungarians and the Ottomans pushing back the British in, in Greece. And so, um, just to kind of show, uh, when you're playing the game, the turns, there are five summer turns and five winter turns, and so, um, <laughs> which means basically each turn is six months, which is a lot, but within those impulses, you know, you can see a lot of movement and a lot of action actually take place. In summer months, or in summer turns, rather, uh, each unit has five movement points. In the winter, they only have four and you have different areas of terrain, like rough, which is sort of a stand-in for, you know, mountains, rough terrain. Uh, that costs two movement points. Clear is one movement point. Um, and then there are certain areas like marshes and forests that also have uh, a little bit of 
uh, movement point cost, and the game does include handy dandy charts to kind of help you with that. Uh, but, you know, so movement's done, you know, very simply, you move one unit at a, at a time. If you're traveling ar along the rail paths, as long as you're doing rail movement, each rail, you know, each hex moved along a rail line is one third of a movement point. So you basically say, you know, for three railed hexes, that's one movement point. So if you're traveling purely by rail, for instance, in a summer turn, a unit uh, may be able to move 15 hexes in an impulse. And if they were to do that, all three impulses, obviously, they're all over, they can be traveling all over the map. Um, the rails are also critically important to supply. So the way the game works with supply is that typically um, a power must draw supply from uh, mobilization centers, which uh, I think I can get one in view here. There's one in Sofia for the Bulgarians uh, that has that factory icon. There's one in, uh, whoops, sorry, Nish for uh, the Serbians, and obviously there's a, a number of others in uh, other countries as well. And so if you can trace either three hexes back to a mobilization hex, you're in supply, or if you can trace three hexes to a rail line that can pass uninterrupted back to such a place that will provide supply to that nation's units. But things like enemy zones of control, enemy units will obviously block that. So if you're used to playing war games, if you understand the way most supply mechanics work in a lot of these games, this is going to be pretty par for course. You're going to be uh, at home with the way that the supply model works. Uh, you will want to be careful because under certain circumstances, some units can draw supply from, say, French or British supply sources, while um, others can't. And, and there is a chart in the game that kind of uh, shows you in the rule book, you know, what, what are the real um, supply sources for each potential country. But it again, it's very uh, straightforward. It makes sense. It's logical. Um, not really going to be uh, too confusing for you. Um, and then, so beyond that, then, with the, with, with the movement, you then would have attacks. And so here, uh, just to show you, I have what is a, what's referred to as an active army. So this is an infantry army with the NATO symbol, army with the four X's NATO symbol, uh, uh, method of uh, identifying units, also showing the color and the name AH. Uh, I also have an expeditionary unit here with uh, the cross box with the darkened uh, sections. They're core level and they typically have lower combat values. And so, uh, and then I, oh, uh, here's a British expeditionary unit that is entrenched. So something that is with this game to represent the entrenching of World War One on the back of most counters is an entrenched side and you're going to see the combat values aren't necessarily different. They are in the case of some units so you know you may want to take a peek it's usually the French that have different units on the different sides of the counter um, the French are better at offense when they're unentrenched, for instance, but they're really the only country that really has that difference. Um, but here, what the entrenchments do is it allows you to take a loss in combat without draining uh, other resources with combat. So typically, you will want your units to be entrenched most of the time, and to entrench takes a unit's entire movement. So I, I w if I'm going to entrench, that unit cannot move, and so that does lend itself to kind of the way the game works where, um, you know, once you entrench, you're really stuck there. But if you're out on the east front, for instance, where there's a lot more maneuvering room, you may be less likely to actually entrench because you want to be able to keep moving. You really want to be able to, to make the advancements and the encirclements. Um, where on the west front, where there's really less places to go because the units are butting right up against each other, uh, you will want to entrench, obviously. So that, that part of this game feels right. But the way combat works is once you uh, or say once you're in your combat phase, you're going to designate a unit to be attacked and the units that are attacking. And so here, I might say, um, you know, firstly, I would during the movement phase, I might entrench all of these guys. Almost got it. There we go. And I'm going to say I'm going to attack the British first uh, or third army here. 
with the Austro-Hungarians, the Ottomans, these three units all together attacking this hex. And so what I'll do is I will add up the first number before the slash. That's the attack value of the attacking unit. So in this case, it's going to be 7 against the defending unit's number on, you know, after the slash, which is the defensive value, so in this case being 4. And what you do is then calculate the differential. So you take the attacking power minus the defending power. So in this case, it's going to be 7 against 4. That's a plus 3 for the attacker. You'll then look at the combat chart to tell you what column that you're going to be rolling on. So it's, uh, you know, plus 3, rolling on the, the plus 3 column. Obviously, if I'm able to get more forces into this combat, then I can add more points. It's going to be more shifts on the, the columns, and it's going to typically result in uh, better results, though I will say the, the combat charts of this game are uh, interesting. We'll, we'll get to it. Um, so based on that, then I would roll a die, and it would tell me what are the losses, the number of losses for the attacker and the defender. So if I were to go and look at an actual... Uh, combat result table here. First we'll, we'll roll the die. I rolled a four. So, let's see if I can get this on camera without it being absolutely awful to look at. So, here's the combat results table looking at plus three and on the four that is a three two result. So, three losses to the attacker, two to the defender. Now the way the game works is that you can choose to take those losses any way you want. So first the attacker is going to take losses, and the importance of entrenchments is the attacker can take one loss for unentrenching all of their units involved in the combat here. So uh, for the three losses for the central powers, we're going to say we're going to take one loss as unentrenching, and importantly unentrenched units do not project a zone of control so that's another sort of pro and con of being entrenched or unentrenched is that only entrenched units have zones of control and then uh, I have to take two losses otherwise now the attacker can choose to uh, either eliminate an entire unit and that will satisfy all the remaining losses but that's not really cohesive uh, for for the front, if you go eliminating units, the alternative is to take those losses as losses or drains on the mobilization point track. So uh, I'm going to pan the camera here, fighting with it a little bit. So here is the mobilization track, and what is sort of important for the mobilization track is that it goes from 0 to 95, and all the countries involved in the, in the war are going to be somewhere along this track. And the, the, what's kind of weird about this game, um, and I, it almost turned me off of it, but I think it works in this game, is that the mobilization point track, your mobilization, mobilization points represent a sort of aggregate abstraction and representation of your country's uh, industrial capacity as well as their uh, morale and basically just their ability to maintain the war. And what's interesting is that these mobilization points are used for taking losses, like in this case, I would look and find uh, the Austro-Hungarians and the Ottomans were both involved in the combat. I can split the losses any way I want, and I have to take two losses. So I'll have the Ottomans lose a point and go from 11 to 10, and I'll have the Austro-Hungarians also take one point and go from 11 to 10. And now they've, you know, the attacker has taken all three of their losses. Um, now, the British are sort of in a similar situation. If I get back to uh, these guys here. Wait one second here. I'm sorry, it's so janky. I'm going to have to cut some of this out. So, here, the, uh, the units are, the, the unit being attacked is not entrenched, which can sometimes happen. You know, you manage to catch an enemy that hasn't been entrenched, and you basically look at that and say, well, 
This unit can do a couple of things for the two losses for the British. You can completely eliminate the unit, again, to satisfy all the losses, but that's not very good. Don't really want that to happen. Uh, we can take two mobilization points as losses and, and move it on the track like we just did for the Ottomans or the Austro-Hungarians. Or alternatively, we can retreat, and each hex retreated will uh, allow for one of those points to be taken. So we could go one, two, and move that sort of out of the way. He retreated two hexes. Uh, and that would suffice for the losses. And of course, there is advancement after combat, so I might have the Ottomans now advance into, uh, this is Salonika, is where that particular hex is. And so that's going to cause uh, potentially some supply problems for this other expeditionary unit. And, you know, now they might have a tougher time surviving in the future. If, for instance, now uh, there was a combat against the, uh, the expeditionary unit there, well, now that unit's out of supply. It can't trace to a friendly supply uh, source, and it can't trace to a railway that's going to connect back to a friendly supply source. They were getting supply through the port of uh, Salonika here. Little uh, little port symbol right there. Um, and so now, as the, the Central Powers, I might say, well, now I'm going to attack from here to here with this unit attacking this unit. Now, you know, I can roll my die, and <laughs> I rolled really bad. Uh, I rolled a six. That's, that's terrible in this game, but uh, let's say if I rolled very well, now I can still take a loss by unentrenching as the British, but if I have any more losses to take, I can either eliminate the unit, I don't want to do that, but if a unit is out of supply, it cannot use mobilization points to take losses for that combat. So this unit would probably have to retreat. It's got no choice. And so that really comes down, you know, that really reveals the ultimate decision-making of your overall strategy in this game, because this is a strategic level game. It has operational feel to certain aspects of it, but it is a strategic level World War I game. Uh, this game will basically, you know, it propositions you with, how do you want to take your losses? Do you give ground in the face of the enemy to avoid losing mobilization points? Or do you simply, you know, let your mobilization points be deducted and, you know, thousands and millions of lives are lost over the course of the war because of you doing that and, and wearing down the industrial economy and the, the morale of the nation as you throw a whole generation's, uh, a generation of men to the, the meat grinder. Um, so, you know, it, it's sort of that, you know, you're ultimately making that decision throughout the game. Um, and is this attack going to be worthwhile? If I take too many losses on the mobilization chart, that might put me in a bad spot, right? So you're going to be making those kinds of decisions. Um, I will say in terms of the combat charts that almost in every column case, or pretty much every column case, every die roll result is typically more harmful for the attacker. Uh, and so you really have to be careful where you're attacking and why you're attacking and hoping for, even if you and your opponent lose the same amount of points in a given attack, that overall the bigger scheme of that front and in the war, that's beneficial to you somehow. Now you might say, well, why do I care about the mobilization points being drained? What's the big deal there? Sure, it's morale, uh, but what, what matters with it, right? Well, that comes into play uh, because... Again, not only are you using these points to take combat losses, they're also used to purchase new armies, uh, to rebuild armies that may have been destroyed, and to also purchase uh, campaign markers, is what they're called. And these campaign markers are going to be... Um, let's see if I can grab a couple here to show you. So these campaign markers are going to range from things like strategy markers that we'll, we'll, I'll talk to a little bit more in, uh, in a minute here later in the video. Tactical markers, if you play a tactical marker, which each side has uh, a small number of them and they have to be purchased with points during the mobilization phase 
to get them, but if you use a tactical marker, you get a 1d6 uh, attack bonus. So in that attack against the British, had I used a tactical marker, I'd get to roll a die and add that many points to the attacker's point value uh, to impact what column we're going to roll on. And these tactical markers are very important. They can make or break you know, where you're attacking. It can mean uh, a chance of success where there would be virtually no chance otherwise, and you can bust a hole uh, and try to make some real big gains. The tactical markers, I guess, are some abstraction of air power in this game. Uh, the, most of these counters are all army level, and so it's a sort of, you know, it includes the infantry, the cavalry, the artillery, uh, but the planes are maybe sort of represented by these tactical markers. They have an airplane on the counter. You know, it's sort of a, a you know, not sure. Uh, you also might have things like this marker, the tank armies marker. This allows the allies to actually build tank armies. There is a year requirement on that, but you would spend some to get this marker, and then you could then immediately start spending money on building the tank armies. Um, which I will talk about in a second. And then these plan markers, which are very important, the plan markers are used to activate fronts. So when we look at the the turn track again, um, the three impulses of a turn, in the first impulse, all fronts can be activated. But in the second or third impulse, each side has to spend, expend, a plan marker to activate a given front. So if they wanted to activate all three fronts in a given impulse, they have to use three plan markers which they will have purchased or started the scenario with. Um, this can be somewhat of a tough thing because later in the game, in the late turns of the war, uh, you won't have as much points to spend or you'll be less willing to risk spending those points on buying all these plan markers. You really want to specialize in where is it going to be most valuable for me to spend my points Knowing how important these points are, it's sort of this gamble, right? Are you willing to invest the points, spend the points, on the armies and abilities and things you're going to need and hope that, in exchange, you're going to get victory points? Now, I guess that's a good time to talk about victory points. You can get victory points a number of different ways in this game. Um, typically, one of the things that you're going to want to be doing is trying to capture important hexes. Damascus is a great example. Damascus has that little flag symbol. That means it's an objective hex for the Allies. The Ottomans, for having that hex, it doesn't really do anything, but it is of importance to the Allies. So if the Allies manage to capture that, they will get five victory points at the end of the game. There are other types of hexes as well that give victory points. So, uh, for instance, there is... Uh, resource hexes like Mosul here uh, has the, the axe uh, or rather the shovel and the pick. Um, these represent resources, maybe oil or, or coal, variety of things. Those are worth, uh, I believe, 10 victory points at the end of the game. Um, they also provide uh, mobilization points during the mobilization phase. So th that's all important. And then obviously, um, we did show this before, you have the various. Uh, factory icons which represent mobilization centers. Those are also worth victory points as are capitals like Sofia and Belgrade. And so by the end of the game, you know, you're going to be looking at what areas have you taken control of. Those are going to be worth victory points. You also get victory points for making powers uh, collapse and or surrender. Um, and that will occur towards the end of a turn based on a number of factors like have they had armies permanently eliminated for being out of supply? Um, will they uh, collapse because their important hexes like their mobilization centers and resources are enemy occupied? Those types of things and when they collapse and surrender uh, obviously terrible things happen like they lose all of their mobilization points maybe they remove all of their units from the map and so on and of course the person making them collapse or surrender we'll get some victory points depending on what year they surrender. And that sort of ends up being a, uh, a bit of a strategy on when can, for instance, uh, the Russians hang on. You know, if they end up having a lot of areas that are um, uh, occupied by the Central Powers, that's going to be a lot of victory points for the Central Powers. It's pretty, they're going to get most of their victory points. 
And if Russia surrenders, then it's going to provide a very large lump sum of victory points. The earlier the Central Powers make other countries, other powers, surrender, they get more victory points. Of course, the same is uh, true for the Allies, but you know the big question will be when will Russia fall, because that's going to be a huge chunk of, of victory points. Um, alternatively, you know the, the Allies might be focused, for instance, on making the Ottomans collapse and surrender, and that's really, um, by my accountants, I keep hitting the stand, sorry about that, um, I think really the Ottomans uh, are really where the Allies are going to get their victory points from taking hexes there and, and making them surrender and so on. Um, the final little bit here probably worth talking about is that there are a number of special units that enter the game later in the warrings. Kind of see some of them here on the Western Front. We have the little uh, armies with the arrow. Those are uh, stormtrooper armies, assault armies, and then you can see the Allies have some tank armies. Uh, they have the silhouette of a, a tank. They're a World War I-style tank on the counter. Those are assault armies, and they're special and important in the game because what they do is the first possible uh, combat losses against the enemy will have to involve some retreat, typically. Um, the only way that won't occur is if the enemy is entrenched and you only score one loss against them, then they can unentrench and it's fine. But as soon as they take a second loss, they have to retreat first before taking any other kinds of losses like MP losses, mobilization point losses, uh, and so on. And so that is how the game will sort of reopen up in the Western Front for movement and the capturing of critical hexes is with these assault armies. Uh, the Allies, you know, France gets... A tank army, the British get two tank armies, the U.S. has a tank army, the Italians have one assault army, and the Russians have one assault army, while the Germans can have up to four assault armies, the Austro-Hungarians get one assault army, and the Ottomans get one assault army, and so on. So, um, that's kind of how that all plays out. Uh, so once you're all done with your impulses, then really the game becomes a question of uh, stri uh, strategic level play of your campaign markers. So once the impulses are done, it then goes to the strategic warfare phase. And here, uh, the different powers can spend their their uh, campaign markers to do a few other things. For instance, um, a strategic marker, campaign marker, can be used to potentially drain mobilization points from an enemy power, depending on a die roll. Um, the Germans or rather the Central Powers, but it's representing the Germans, can cause a naval campaign die roll by using their naval campaign marker. And this is sort of how the naval uh, uh, campaigns of World War I are sort of abstracted heavily down to a single die roll per turn. And essentially this is, you know, battle for the North Sea, a battle of Jutland or Jutland. And within that, basically, um, you'll roll a die, uh, the, the Central Powers will roll a die, and it might range from a Allied strategic victory where the Central Powers lose their naval marker, and it also means that Germany's going to lose some mobilization points, Britain's going to gain some, but then it might mean that the Central Powers might get a tactical victory or something where they drain some British MP, the Germans are going to gain some MP, but critically, and the reason why the Central Powers will want to make that die roll is if they can roll the result of a strategic Central Powers victory, not only do they get to get some mobilization points from the British, uh, but it also will mean that the blockade is broken. Now, the, at the beginning of the game, the blockade is in effect, and the blockade is going to provide victory points for the Allies every turn that it's in, in effect. And really, that's probably the other major way that the Allies get victory points in this game, is they'll rack up seven victory points for every turn, that the blockade is in effect. Whenever the Central Powers can break the blockade with that naval campaign marker, one, it forces the Allies to get rid of the blockade marker, and they'll also lose their naval marker. And what that's going to do is it's going to provide Germany a bonus 10 mobilization points in the mobilization phase, which comes up next. Uh, it's going to provide the Austro-Hungarians five bonus mobilization points. 
It's also going to provide five victory points for the Central Powers, and when you figure that that's also seven victory points that the Allies aren't getting, that's a pretty big swing. Now, uh, this is obviously very bad for the Allies just for that reason, but they also, if they want to keep that from happening again, will need to spend their own mobilization points on buying back their naval marker and buying back the blockade, and that's actually quite expensive, really, uh, depending on how the game is going and how drained of points they are. And so it's a really big coup for the Central Powers to roll that success, but it is a die roll and it is a gamble risk. Um, obviously, you know, if the Central Powers are low on mobilization points, or Germany specifically is low on mobilization points, then they may not want to risk losing more in that campaign die roll. And if they're... Uh, close to zero, for instance, um, they might really want to be careful uh, of losing those points because it might cause them to enter a collapse state, which would be catastrophic. Uh, so I like the way the naval campaign role in mechanics are dealt with because it provides an incentive for the central powers to engage in it. The onus is on them to initiate that die roll and to see what happens for them to come out of port in Kiel. Um, but it might go bad for them, or it might go you know, really good for them. And, and ultimately, the Allies have a little bit of impact on that. Basically, if they choose to use their naval marker, then the die results are a little bit harder for the Central Powers to win that strategic victory. Um, but later in the game, the Central Powers can be playing their Unrestricted Submarine Warfare Campaign marker, which, when they play that, uh, is going to take two d6, or two rolls of the dice of mobilization points away from Britain. The only way to stop that is if the Allies use their naval marker, which then means if they use it there, they can't use it uh, to... Uh, they can't use it to impact the die roll success of the naval campaign. So that's sort of how the Central Powers can increase their likelihood of breaking up the, the blockade. But by using unrestricted submarine warfare, that makes it easier for the United States to be influenced during that activation of neutral step. So there is, you know, all these little parts that are relatively simple die rolls and simple mechanics do work together to form a, a simulation, a light simulation of the World War I uh, mechanics. So once the, uh, the strategic warfare phase is over, then you go to mobilization. Um, each country is going to get mobilization points now based on the, the hexes that they control, uh, plus certain turn, turn modifiers. So uh, there's a really handy player aid chart that was created by a gamer on BoardGameGeek. I'll put the link down in the description below. Um, I printed it out for my use, and it's just awesome to use. It's very quick. Normally, you would have to look out here and count the different hexes and double-check to see what's different and add up the values and add them down on the mobilization uh, track down here, but the, his printout is nice because you can just say, well, you know, have, has Germany lost anything? No, then they're, they're going to have 55 mobilization points from their hexes, and then you look to see if they've gained any other hexes in the process, and then you add that to the total. Um, but this is a typical, like, income phase, right? You're going to count up all these conditions of the hexes that are in control, and you're going to get points for it, you might get some points for taking enemy territory, but it's very circumstantial. Typically, you're only going to get mobilization points for the resource hexes. So if you're looking to get a beef up to your economy, grabbing those first might be a goal for you. Um, if we look here, they're like uh, it's covered up by Austro-Hungarian units, but over on the right, um, over here, is Kiev, which is a resource space. So that's a great bonus for the Austro-Hungarians to have that. Uh, so once you get that, you will add the uh, mobilization points to the track for the markers. And once you're done doing that, you are then going to spend your mobilization points on whatever you deem uh, necessary. And when you're playing a two-player game, this is meant to be secret. So you should grab a piece of paper, and each player will write down what they're spending and what they're buying, and then reveal that to each other and set it up as as needed and it should be the player with initiative should place any newly built armies first on the map and so you're going to be building armies 
you're going to be buying back uh, the campaign markers, um, that sort of thing, and then you're going to end up with, you know, you'll then deduct the mobilization points from here, and that will be your current mobilization point value going into the next turn. Because the purchases are done secretly, and the reason for that is that what you, whatever mobilization points you have left over will dictate the initiative. So it's secret because you don't really know, right? You might say, well, I don't want to spend too much or else I'm going to let him have initiative first before I do, but that might mean I don't buy enough of the stuff I really need to use. Or you might say, I want to go second and I want to keep a healthy bank of mobilization points to take losses. I'm going to spend, but I'm going to spend just enough just to do barely what I think I need to do. And so that's sort of the uncertainty of who's going to get initiative. When you're playing solo, obviously, you can't have secret purchases. So I did come up with a solo variant to sort of, you know, impact as you're playing and you're trying to do it all by yourself, how to make smart purchases and still have initiative be uncertain. And uh, it's the same link down in the description below to my my other variant for diplomacy. It's the solo initiative variant also on BoardGameGeek and that same thread if you want to check that out. Um, but yeah, so once that's complete, once mobilization is complete and all the new units are placed, then that just moves it on to the next turn and you keep on playing through. Uh, again, uh, there are summer and winter turns. A winter turn, in addition to having lower movement points, uh, the defender also gets a plus two bonus to their defense strength. So there will be times when you're playing during the winter turns where you're not able to quite do as much damage or do as much fighting as you might like to uh, because the odds just really aren't in your favor. But, you know, that might be a really good turn to, say, regain mobilization points, for instance. Um, one of the interesting things, I guess, I would like to point out with the way the game works and the... Uh, so the combat table is that if you look, and I'll zoom in here, the base strengths for these nations all vary, but typically a French unit is going to have an attack of 4, a defense of 3, and a German unit is always going to have, either entrenched or not, an attack of 4 and a defense of 6, while the French, you know, if they entrench, it's a little bit different. They're going to have a 3 and a 4. If you look at, say, the Russians, then, you're going to see that their values are typically 3 and 3. There's one special unit that's a 3-4, but it's typically 3 and 3. Now, what the net effect of that is on the game is that if you look at the combat results chart, and I'll bring it up again just to kind of show, hopefully it'll be a little bit readable here. I printed these out from the PDF of the rules. Um... It is very difficult to eliminate a unit. Now, a unit's eliminated when the losses on the chart exceed their defensive value. In that case, they are mandatorily destroyed. But there's no 6 on the def defense table. So, in any normal attack, the German unit is not going to be destroyed. It's very hard for a German unit to be destroyed. But if you look at the top row, a die roll of 1, if you get strong enough attack modifiers on the on the table here, you could take out a Russian army, you could take out a French army, depending, you know, again, if you roll those ones. And they can happen, and they come out, you know, if you're rolling a 1d6, a 1's going to come up often enough that, yeah, you are going to eliminate units, but the Germans are going to stay strong. Now, there is a special modification to the attack rules where if you're attacking... What's re it's referred to in the rules as concentrically, meaning you're attacking a unit from one side, and that and all attacking units are adjacent to all hexes that are adjacent to the enemy unit. It's really kind of hard to explain. The rulebook does a great job of showing examples, and I, I should just point out, by the way, that I do think the rulebook's pretty well put together. It has a lot of great color examples. An attack that looks like this... these two units, or maybe these three units, all attacking this guy, is a concentric attack. Even these two units by themselves attacking that unit is a concentric attack because they are adjacent to 
every, they are either in or adjacent to every hex adjacent to the target unit. And what that's going to do is it's going to double the defender losses. So if you rolled and the result was like a 3 slash 2, if this was any normal attack, the British could just take 2 hits uh, because the defense value of the unit is 2, it's not destroyed. But if you double the defender losses for the concentric attack, that result is really a 3-2, but the 2 is doubled to 4. 4 exceeds the defense value of 2. This unit would be destroyed. And when units are destroyed from a concentric attack like that, they are permanently destroyed, which means they cannot be rebuilt, and that's one of the conditions that impacts a country collapsing or surrendering, is having permanently uh, eliminated units. So to put that in perspective and just to show that this game kind of tries to represent the different doctrines and training and troop strengths of the different nations, the only way to even eliminate a German unit at all is either because the German player lets it be destroyed rather than taking MP losses or retreating or something, or it's been concentrically attacked and you've got a 4 result which doubles to 8, which exceeds 6, which means the unit's destroyed. If it was a 3 defender result, doubled to 6, it doesn't exceed the defense value of 6, and that German unit could survive if the defending player decided to deduct those points from their mobilization track. At the end of the day, you're going to be fighting these battles across the, uh, the course of the game, and you are going to be looking to drain the opponent of mobilization points so that they are close to zero, and once you're at zero mobilization points, you can't take mobilization points as losses. So then those units either need to retreat when attacked or be eliminated. And that's really where the Allies can make headway against the Germans by just battering them and battering them until they get low on mobilization points, at which point the uh, central power player has no choice but to retreat uh, in the face of the Allied onslaught or just end up risking the loss of, enti of armies entirely. So that's sort of how it, it gets into it. Um, yeah, so I think that's most uh, of all the mechanics of the game. Um, obviously, there's a bit more to it. You would get that by reading the rulebook. Uh, the rulebook is a color rulebook. It's 32 pages. Um, I think it does a good job of explaining the rules, uh, and it does have some nice color examples that do a good job of showing the kind of different mechanics and how they would actually play out in a, in a battle uh, during the course of the game. So it does a really good job with that. One thing probably worth pointing out is that the, the rules on the first time through, the first game I played, I ran into some issues where things were not clear, um, and basically it felt like the game didn't get a test run by a new player to check for inconsistencies or difficult things or clarifications. Uh, and so I needed to go out to ConSim World, which is, a, if you don't know, it's a forum for war games and board games and stuff. Um, and that's where the designer of this version, Joe Miranda, uh, tends to hang about to answer questions. And I had like 10 questions that needed all clarification. And I will say I'm, I'm very glad... Joe was able to provide answers to the questions, and all of those questions formed the basis of the first errata for this game, the July 2018 errata. All thanks to me. You know, send the thanks in the mail, guys. Um, but he did provide that. He did provide the clarifications that I needed, and when I played the game a second time with the rules uh, errata that he provided in guidance, the game was much smoother. It played great, I think. Just as a, you know, yeah, maybe it's a knock against the game that I had to have those questions at all, and it needed those clarifications, but props to, uh, you know, Decision Games, or at least Joe Miranda, for jumping to it, and within a day or two, he had answers for all the questions. All the issues I had with the game were resolved because of that, so if you're looking to play this game, before you do anything, get the rule book, get a PDF of the rules, grab the errata, from the Board Game Geek page. I put it in the wiki of the Board Game Geek page for the game. Um, it's also out there in ConSim World. So grab the errata. That's going to resolve any issues you might have with the rules because otherwise the rules were pretty well put together. Um, so, uh, you know, keep that in mind. But okay, let's go to uh, the final thoughts. Okay, so what did I think of the game? Um, 
Well, to, to cut to the chase a little bit, I think it's a, a pretty great game. Um, if I were to put it on a scale, I'd, I'd probably put it around like 8.5 out of 10, or a, a, a B-plus rating. Um, I had a lot of fun with this one, uh, both playthroughs. I, I did one playthrough with the interactive diplomacy, and I did a playthrough with the historical entry, and the first game went really hard towards the central powers, because... They got really lucky with, with diplomacy. They managed to get Romania on the Central power side instead of the Allies. Uh, the Italians ended up never coming in for the Allies, and the U.S. came in, but very, very late. Um, so that had a big impact, and just sort of the, the balance of the game went really hard that way. Uh, with the historical entry, because, you know, things were a little more balanced, it was a much tighter game. The Central power still won, but I think that came down to just better die rolls ended up occurring. Um, and critically, a few blockade rolls went well, and they broke the blockade a few times, which really impacted the BP scale, victory point scale, a good bit. Um, but I think the Allies can, can definitely win, and I, I think the Allies, in order to win, they, they really need to be aggressive. I think all things the same, the Central Powers have a larger margin of error in this game, um, and so if you're playing this and, you, and you've learned the rules and you're playing it and you want to teach somebody else, you might want to let the new person play as the central powers to keep it balanced. Um, because as the allies, you really need to be aggressive. And if you're not aggressive, uh, you're, you're probably going to find that the central powers get a in sort of an economic advantage and that they can get their mobilization points and hold on to them. And they're only losing them in combats on combats that they want to fight and that they think they can win. So as the Allies, you have to really be pounding on the Germans, for instance, to lower their mobilization points to keep them drained constantly as much as possible so that they can't get too much of an advantage, so that they can't buy armies without any thought to what they're going to lose later and let them get out of control, because that can happen. Um, I, I think for... You know, if you want a, a, a low-complexity World War One game, I think this fits the bill perfectly. Um, I would imagine it would probably take, if you're really playing it and focused on it, five hours or less. So, you know, maybe the first time you're trying to play with somebody, it might take five or six hours to, to get used to the rules and to get into the rhythm. But once you're really, you really know the rules, you really know what you're doing, you could probably bang this game out in maybe three hours, something like that. I think that that's conceivable if you're really moving. And of course, I'm playing it, I had been playing it solo, and I mulled over actions for a while. I'd walk away from the game, come back, and kind of mess around with it. But I don't think it would take very long to, to get through this. Um, now, it doesn't replace something like, you know, my, my tried and true uh, monster game, like Fatal Alliances, uh, because this takes, you know, 100 hours or more or something. Um, but if you, you know, say, didn't want to deal with the card mechanics of a Paths of Glory or something along those lines, and you just wanted a good old Hex Encounter uh, of World War One, I, I think this, this will do it for you. Um, yeah, there were some, some things that, you know, you might run into issues with, like the 1D6 and the swingy results that can happen, but of course... If you're playing across an entire game of 10 turns, all those die rolls will, will sort of, you know, come out even for you, uh, likely will. You might run into some really abnormal results, but it should, at the end of the day, work out okay. Um, you know, the only thing that can suck is you can feel like you're making all the right all the right decisions. So you've got your line on the front all set up the way you want. You're making the right large-scale decisions and, and where you're attacking and what you're doing. But sometimes the dice just doesn't agree with you, and they are keeping you back from success. And that can be a little bit frustrating, but all war games tend to have that a little bit if they use a die. It might have been nicer to have, maybe instead of a 1d6, a 2d6 type of thing, where you get more of a probability belt, you know, a bell curve for probability rather than a flat distribution. Um, and that might have made some things a little bit better. Uh, you could have probably, probably would have required messing around with the combat results table a little bit. Um, but, you know, I, I think the game still works. I was a little un uncertain of economics, morale, and so on, all being fused into one resource. I typically don't like that in games, but I think it works in this game. 
Um, it, it works pretty well, and so I won't knock it for that. I think it, it, it works out okay in this game. It's part of the strategic decision-making and balance of the game, whereas if it was just some other game and it was just all one resource, it might feel um, arbitrary, but here it feels right. Um, but again, you know, I think... The, the central powers will have an easier time of it when you're first playing this game because they just, you know, those German armies aren't going to go away. They're not going to be easily destroyed, um, and they're going to constantly be a really strong threat, whereas the Allies have to be a little more careful. They have the less room for error when making different decisions. Um, in terms of the components, uh, you know, the counters are, are pretty good quality. Um, they're not super-duper thick. They're not the ultra-quality counters, but they, but they work for what they are. Um, I might get my clippers to them and around the corners, but some of the print is really close to the corner, so it might mess with that. Um, the map is mounted. I put plexi over it anyway, just because that's how I am, but uh, the mounted map is good. The map looks pretty. It's nice. The rule book is 32 pages. Color, pretty well laid out. It provides a, provides a lot of good uh, picture examples of combat and weird combat situations, like, oh, how do these assault armies work? Well, the, the rules provide good detail on showing you how they do work. So you could read through the rules and then come to the table and have a pretty good idea of how to get going and, and how to operate uh, on the game. Um, the one trouble that almost imperiled the game for me was when I started running into those rules issues. Um, and they were going to be very frustrating if I couldn't figure out how to resolve them because it was like, well, what do I, you know, what do, I do here? I, it's, it's not clear. Um, but fortunately, Joe Miranda, the developer and designer for this edition of the game, uh, for Decision Games, jumped into action and was able to provide the clarifications that I needed. And with his clarifications and with the current July 2018 errata, I feel the game is more complete. And, and the second playthrough with the errata ended up going very smoothly, very well, everything. I didn't really have any, oh, what do I do now moments in the second playthrough because I think he had addressed those issues. It kind of sucks that he had to do that and that those things couldn't have just been in the game to begin with, but errata and clarifications are sort of part of you know, war games in general, so it's hard to knock them for that. Um, he did a good job. He was able to provide those answers, I, and so you know, with that in mind, I think the whole cohesive package because of that is stronger for it. Um, it works really well. So just in terms of, you know, do you want to get this game? Should you get this game? Well, the price point was right. I, I think I paid 60 bucks for this deluxe edition box from Decision Games. Um, and for what I'm getting, which again is a nice lower complexity uh, rendition of World War I with all the fixins and, and you know, um, a lot of interesting, fun mechanics and, and the struggle of the war is felt as you play through this, um, I think I had a lot of fun. So 8.5 out of 10, B+. Plus. Whatever, it's a good game. I had a lot of fun with it. I'm going to keep having fun with it. I think I'm going to play this uh, more for sure in the future, when, especially when I don't have the time for uh, the bigger games, the longer games. So, World War One Deluxe Edition, Decision Games. Check it out. Thanks for watching. Catch you later.